It is a pleasure to be here. My name is Mara Aspinall. I am the proud co-chair of White Hat this year. And on behalf of the AZ Bio and Joan Kerber Walker, welcome to one of the, we think, the best sessions of White Hat this year. It is terrific to have you. We have a fantastic panel. Um, and organizing and moderating our panel is Kimberly Ha. Kimberly is the founder and CEO of KKH Advisors. She is one of the best communication specialists in the world. Uh, she has a focus on life science and digital health strategic communication. She was previously director at FTI Consulting, and she brought a broad range of clients from Fortune 500 to early stage companies to talk to them about positioning themselves, the company, in crisis times, in expansion times, in uh, times of challenge like we're having now. Previously, she was global editor of Biofarm Insight. Many of you know it's a business intelligence service launched by the Financial Times Group. We are lucky to have her tremendous experience in M&A, in reporting, in communications as our moderator today. So I hand it over to Kimberly. Welcome to everyone. And Kimberly, thank you for your work on our panel today. Thanks, Mara. Really glad to be back at White Hat. Uh, I remember, Joan, I think it was at least five, six years ago when I was out in Arizona attending White Hat in person. Hopefully we'll be able to do that again. I'm uh, really glad to have an esteemed panelist group. Um, I guess let's start and kick off with speaker bio, uh, speaker introductions first, I guess, starting with uh, Sarah. I'm, I'm really, really pleased to be here. I was hoping to make it to Arizona this year. It would have been my first White Hat conference, but that did not come to pass. Uh, I'm Sarah Demi, and I am the founder and CEO of an organization, a company called Demi Colton. Demi Colton is, if uh, for those of you who are familiar or, or who attend, uh, go to J.P. Morgan and Biotech Showcase. Our, our company is the founder of Biotech Showcase. Uh, we also um, organize uh, CEO Summit, and we uh, were just recently about to launch a meeting here in New York City called BioFuture. Uh, COVID got in the way of that, like it did in like that in the way of many plans of many other organizations. And, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with that in mind, we decided to move to uh, doing virtual salons. And so we've la launched our virtual salon series, which captures a lot of the information and content that would have been available at BioFuture if we were able to go forward with it. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I've been in the industry for many years prior to launching my own company. I was the head of business development investor uh, relations at the biotech industry organization for quite a while and built many of the programs that if you attend bio that you probably participate in today. So thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thanks, Sarah. I guess uh, let's let's go to Mara. I know a lot of people already know who Mara is, but uh, thanks, Mara. I don't know if that's good or bad news, but it is great to be here. I am pleased to say I think this is my fourth white hat. So I am thrilled to be working with Joan and all of you. Um, I, I have, uh, I'll, I'll talk about my two hats today. Um, one is um, co-founder and managing director of Bluestone Venture Partners, a life sciences venture firm focused on diagnostics, devices, and digital health. We are a relatively young firm. We have had, had four investments. We've already sold one of them very profitably to exact sciences. Three of those investments are in Arizona, and one of them we actually initially met at a White House White Hack conference a short time ago. So um, we focus primarily in the Southwest and what we call the NATO states, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Oklahoma, but we're open to good deals more broadly from there. Uh, our focus is really looking for diamonds in the desert. Um, companies, management teams that are not on the two coasts. And as a result of that, we found some fantastic companies. 
our Arizona um, companies are GT MedTech um, and Pix Health right now in Phoenix and in Tucson. My second um, job is, and I'm very proud also relating to Arizona, I was the founder of the School of Biomedical Diagnostics at Arizona State University. And right now in the midst of COVID, nothing is more important than diagnostics. And we are the only place to focus on diagnostics as an independent discipline. And I curate and manage testing.com, which uh, testingcommons.com, which if you haven't looked at is the most comprehensive database of COVID commons, COVID related tests. I uh, also have the privilege of sitting on a, a bunch of public company boards. So I'm thrilled to be here and really talk about the venture environment and the kind of companies we see at White House and beyond. Great, thanks so much, Mara. And last but not least, Sherman. I've known Sherman for several years now, the close friend. And, uh, you know, I met him when he was a healthcare banker in New York, now turned a VC investor. Yes, exactly. Um, so great to meet you all. My name is Sherman Williams. Um, I wear two hats like Mara. Um, um, I am running, I'm the managing partner for the Academy Investor Network. So we're an investment fund that also syndicates investments from military service academy graduates. I was a, a Naval Academy graduate and Naval officer myself before matriculating on to University of Chicago Booth for my MBA and then healthcare M&A investment banking for many years. Um, life science tools, diagnostics, devices, digital health were my kind of my key areas and also covered down pretty heavily on genetic medicine, gene therapy, and gene editing, helping take several companies public uh, in that space. Um, and uh, so that's that's my, my it's a new fund, Academy Investment Network. Uh, I wear two hats in the sense that uh, I also am running the pre seed program for uh, one of our investors in AIN, which is Scout Ventures. They focus on dual use government technology. Um, so from from Scout Ventures, I'll be uh, they've made actually an investment in healthcare. Um, actually, one of their most successful investments is in healthcare. They've, they're on their third fund, and they've got uh, about 80 investments. They want to expand their presence in healthcare through me. Um, and so I'll be looking at digital health investment investments um, and some diagnostic investments on behalf of Scout Ventures. So um, great to meet you all. Great. Thanks, Sherman. And I know uh, basically this panel will really be discussing sort of the decade ahead. Um, but before that, I guess um, for Mara and Sherman, I know you kind of went in briefly about and spoke briefly about your respective funds. I guess if you could talk a bit about to the audience members what technologies, innovations, therapeutic areas your funds are interested in, um, what types of companies, and I know we kind of talked about this before, but are there any technologies or companies that um, you're interested in sort of post-COVID and has that sort of change? I'm looking at a lot of things in the digital health space. Um, I particularly specialize in digital health requiring FDA approval. Um, I'm one of those weird people that got super excited when those new remote, remote patient monitoring codes come out. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's that's an area that um, that we're looking at. And I will say that um, what you've really seen is um, six to ten years of digital transformation occur in six months. Um, so and being a VC investor, everything I'm investing in, I'm expecting to pan out. Uh, several years from now. So really, this is what, what's occurring now post COVID is just validation or during COVID is just validation for some of the things I was seeing. Um, and it's really testing those those hypotheses that we have at COVID. Um, I think we're kind of somewhat spot on in, in many different instances. So nothing's nothing's changed from a digital health standpoint. Nothing's changed too dramatically. Um, I'm really, really, it's just the ability for a lot of these companies to handle the scale that is coming their way. Um, so that's, that's what I'm seeing. So I agree with everything Sherman said. I'm very interested in digital health. Um, we're actually on the other side of digital health, so it's not requiring FDA approval. And uh, Picked Health is, is an example of that. So in the app space. Um, from an investment point of view, we are looking for investments for which COVID is relevant, but not 100% of their focus. When you see testingcommons.com, you will see that there are 1,700 
1,716 to be clear, um, tests that are available one way or another around the world. There's no way, even if we are testing for COVID a year from now, and I believe we will be, um, I believe that much of the uh, COVID-related functions, both tests and digital health apps, will be consolidated in a small number of people. So if you're smart enough to pick those that will be acquired, that's great. But I think the vast majority of them will go back to their base business that is not COVID-related. I also agree with Sherman that um, the speed in which things have happened, I call it no excuses. In the old days, I was too busy. I can't do this. I don't have the system. And somehow people who, doctor's offices in particular, who for nine years, you said, you know, wouldn't do it, literally did it in nine days. So I think that that is the big exchange. The other area of investment that I believe will become sustainable is diagnostics. Um, my personal background, spending 20 years uh, running large and small companies in diagnostics in uh, Tucson with Broche and Boston with Genzyme. Diagnostics has often been kind of the outlier in healthcare investment. I think that the focus on diagnostics today, the increased regulation, I actually think is a good thing for diagnostics because we now have more predictable reimbursement and more reliable systems. And I believe that will show that diagnostics will continue to have a boost during, during the rest of COVID, which I think is a year to 18 months from now, with or without a vaccine, and then in the years to come after that. So I continue to be bullish more than I ever have before on that industry. Great, thanks. So I guess Sarah, um, you've been involved in the biotech industry for many years. Um, what are you seeing across um, your radar in terms of companies that uh, you've spoken with about your new conference about future. I know that you mentioned you're also launching a new virtual salon series. Can you talk a bit about, you know, the, the companies and the startups in this ecosystem right now that you're seeing? Thank you, Kimberly. Um, in terms of, of bio future, I've been, yeah, let me take a step back. Yes, I've been in the industry for many years with a deep background in the biotech uh, industry organization and then following that up with the work that uh, we did over the years to grow uh, biotech showcase, digital medicine, medtech showcase, China showcase, seed showcase into an event that brings 3,800 people and over 400 companies to uh, San Francisco at the same time as the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference every year. Um, most of that career had been focused pretty much on, you know, on bi traditional biopharma and uh, digital medicine, med tech. As we are moving into uh, the establishment of our meeting called Biofuture here in New York City, we are focused in on those technologies that will be the technologies of the future, those technologies and companies that will actually change the way healthcare is, um, is delivered. And um, it's brought me into a new space. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we will be talking about um, healthcare systems and how healthcare is delivered. It's, it's a topic that I, in, in my career, have never really uh, handled before, but it's going to be a very big part of, of BioFuture. We're also seeing a lot of the new cutting edge technology companies, both in AI and digital medicine and big data uh, that are part and parcel of what we will be talking about at, at BioFuture. We're looking at, you know, the newest technologies in in vivo, gene therapy, um, uh, uh, diagno diagnosing of Alzheimer's disease. So getting back to Mara's comment about diagnostics, we think that diagnostics um, will absolutely be here and be much more important in, in the future. There's a company by the name of Thrive that uh, recently got approval for a, a blood test to diagnose cancer. And you think about, think about what it will mean in the future to bring easy, inexpensive diagnoses, diagnostic tools to the general population, um, you know, uh, that can be uh, 
uh, where you can get an answer, you know, very quickly. I think uh, diagnostics going forward will be really very important, uh, uh, you know, in uh, um, in healthcare going forward. I also think that because of COVID, we will have a bigger focus on microbial agents that will infect people. And I know that one of the things that we are looking at doing now for uh, one of our virtual salons will be a focus on microbes. We did a session on COVID, um, talking about with, with some of the doctors, one of whom had been involved in uh, the Bergamo um, uh, um, debacle, so to say, who led a clinical trial, a uh, compassionate use clinical trial for a therapeutic that had, uh, uh, that was being used for a transplant TMA. And so that, that was a very, very well received uh, uh, um, event, if you will. Um, so I think, I think, um, uh, the virtual salon series is also going to be featuring discussions on metabesity. We'll be talking about finance in this space. Uh, we just finished doing one on futurescaping of oncology, and I anticipate that we will continue to add to, to those discussions going forward. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I think, uh, are there, I guess, like anti infectives I know as an industry, we haven't been that diligent in terms of investing in new companies and technologies in the anti infective space. Like post COVID, do you see that changing based on just, you know, government grants, the funding, landscape changing? You know, how do we uh, incentivize companies in this space, um, you know, so that, you know, there's new innovations and new drugs um, in, in this sector? Yes, I, I think that there will be, um, and not just a knee-jerk reaction to COVID, but I think more broadly, there will be more focus on infectious disease. I think what the pandemic showed us, and I just did a podcast on this last week, is if you look in the last 100 years, depending on how many people dead, sadly, but there are essentially five pandemics that have happened in the last 100 years, and that doesn't include 1918. And so, from that perspective, there are many more of these large infectious events. Now, the, the, none of the last ones impacted the U.S. clearly as much as this one has. But when the U.S. gets involved, good or bad, the rest of the world takes notice and we've got the most money to focus on it. So, I think broadly infectious disease diagnostics as well as anti-infective will have a, um, a, a rebirth in this country and around the world. Great. Thanks, Mark. Sherman, what are you seeing on the digital health side, digital tech side in terms of, are, are you guys interested in like specific apps or technology directed at COVID-19 tracking, or do you think this is new, too niche, I guess? No, I, I do not think it's too niche, but uh, I think COVID-19 is, is but one example of a wider problem that digital health solves for. So it's leveraging, leveraging technologies to improve, ultimately improve clinical outcomes uh, of patients or even prevent, prevent folks from um, having some sort of issue. And another thing that digital health also helps bring about um, is that buzzword population health management. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, like I said, COVID-19 is something that people foresaw, I mean, for, for many, many, many years, right? And, and, and there have been digital health companies and diagnostics companies, like I've specialized in diagnostics. I, I tell people I would have made a lot more money as a banker if I wasn't focused on diagnostics when I was, when I was a banker, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, people have, have thought about this for a long time. COVID-19 is really just revealing a lot of issues that we have. Um, uh, particularly here in the United States and, and, and really around the world. And, and so I, 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 I'm looking for, it's not that I'm looking for companies that can solve for COVID-19. My thought process is if you're the next crop of companies that will improve clinical outcomes, prevent people from having issues, better help uh, governments handle uh, ep epidemics, um, 
then you not only would be good for condition, you'd be good in general, and of course you'd be good for COVID-19. That's my thought process. Mm -hmm. Good. Are there any, like, I know telemedicine, telehealth, um, kind of a mixed opinion. Some people think that because of COVID-19, it's going to accelerate, you know, everybody's going to use telehealth, but do you, like, are there any sectors that, I mean, this is an open question for everyone that you think are overhyped or as an investor, you're kind of, you know, on the flip side, staying away from, because it's kind of like a herd mentality. Everyone's kind of rushing into them. I, I was there in the very beginning. I'll take this question first, guys. I, I, I wasn't there at the very beginning, not very, very beginning, but I was around some years ago when digital therapeutics were getting a lot of, um, you know, a lot of press and a lot of buzz. Um, and I do believe in, general, in digital therapeutics long term, uh, but I think in the near to medium term, I'm a little bit, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say down, but I'm humbled, I would, I would say, um, with respect to my enthusiasm for digital therapeutics. I think there are limitations to the the indications that it's able to treat, you know, obviously, it's, you know, mainly behavioral health, and I also think that um, there are other mediums other than a phone that will enable us to interact with a patient that will become more ubiquitous, like VR, uh, virtual reality, AR, where digital therapeutics will work a little bit better. So that's I, that's one area where I'm, I'm you know, uh, like I said, I wouldn't I wouldn't say down on at all. I would just say humbled. And I think myself and a lot of us have learned a lot seeing some of the issues that pair therapeutics and some of the other players uh, have faced. I believe we will see the use of text and apps at an unprecedented rate. It's happened today and it will continue to accelerate, not just in health, but in particular in health as doctor's offices realize it's the cheapest, fastest, and while not perfectly secure, the most secure way they can interact with their patients. So, and, and I, I come at this from, uh, I'm not an investor in the space, but what I see happening and the discussions that we're having, having around uh, biofuture and some of our th you know, forward-looking thinking, <clears throat> now that telehealth is here, I don't think people will go back to not having it. Telehealth um, provides people in the, if you will, in the flyover space uh, with an opportunity to get medical care and to get quality medical care. And to your point, Mara, everybody does have a phone. So while that doesn't bring therapeutics or other interventional diagnostics to that person, at least they would have access, uh, you know, to uh, to medical care. I believe that. A lot of the, our healthcare systems are thinking about what they need to do beyond the brick and mortar of a hospital in order to deliver healthcare in a bigger and better way, uh, you know, to the communities that they serve. And there, are, there are certainly movements afoot here in New York City with organizations such as Northwell Health, or if you go down to Duke University or UPMC, they're looking, you know, looking for logical ways to push care outside of the community hospital and to br and bring care to to individuals so I, I i think that's going to be very important going forward once people have a taste of the convenience of being able to do a digital appointment you know with their doctor why wait in the doctor's office or wait months to try to get an appointment i i just don't see us going back and i think our forward-looking you know, view of this is that it will definitely be here to stay and improved upon, but it's here to stay. Yeah, and Kimberly, I, I also say for when it comes to telemedicine, I think um, just continue with Sarah and, and Mara saying, I think the trend of patients being treated outside of a brick and mortar setting will uh, being tr actually treated outside that setting will continue, but and, and that will manifest itself in multiple forms: telemedicine, wearables, at-home fluid testing, uh, meds being sent to your house, etc. Um, and, and telemedicine specifically is only one part of the trend. We have a shortage of primary care physicians in the United States, uh, and there's equally a shortage of the, those kind of physicians around the world. Uh, but we do have the technology to treat those patients at scale without the doctor being physically present with the patient. Uh, so right. this, this ability is new, and so you're seeing a step change and a paradigm shift in line with what Sarah is saying. I don't think we will completely go back to the way we were doing things before. Um, but I will say that, um, and maybe this is controversial, I don't know, but I do not think that telemedicine is enough alone. 
I think that we need objective biometric feedback from the patient through an FDA approved or cleared medical device that they wear, it's in their home, et cetera. And that's gonna be a key component to treating that patient in a better way. Um, Sherman, I completely, completely agree with you. In fact, in, in one of our various discussions about by the future before uh, uh, COVID interfered, we were actually speaking to a, a German automotive manufacturer that is build, planning to, in the future, build sensors into the seat of the car and the and the steering wheel so that as you're driving your doctor can follow you and follow your you know everything uh, uh you know about you in order to help you maintain your health we're also you know looking you know I, i'm sure you've heard of a couple an organization called human longevity where they com do complete scans of your body and um you know right now it's really way too expensive for most people to to afford but in the future um uh, people will get a, a you know a, a roadmap uh, you know your your uh the care guide for your body how will you, what what are your propensities for disease that you have to look you know out for uh, uh how can you how will you take care of yourself so that you stay out of the hospital and we focus on wellness care versus care uh, so the, the, and, uh, all of that will be enabled by the tools uh, that we're in the process of developing. And then another client basically had to spin off their China subsidiary as a U.S. Um, headquartered company. So I think that is definitely, um, you know, increasingly on the minds of CEOs and CFOs and management teams as they're looking to raise financing. So. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of these issues have been around. CFIUS has been around for many, many years. CFIUS was purposefully kept vague by the U.S. government so they can make right. decisions on a case-by-case -case basis um, and um, without facing these sort of repercussions. But what you're, what you're seeing right now, um, and I think everyone needs to level set on this, and it's somewhat sad, but it is what it is. Um, you're seeing a complete decoupling happening between China and the United States. And that will happen in every aspect of our life, including the life sciences. Um, the rules are not clear. I do suspect that the rules um, will become more clear, that that will change, um, particularly if we have a change um, in administrations, not to be political whatsoever, but if we have a change in political administrations, I think that the rules will become a bit more clear, but right now they, they are not. Um, I, I, the emphasis right now is on China. Um, if you do, if you are a company looking, like if you ever think as a company you will want to get a government contract, I think taking money from China right now, right now as it stands, is, is a no go. I, even if the administration changes, I don't think that will change. I think I think that trend will continue, but um, I think we'll have a little bit more clarity and more articulation as to why. Um, they'll be able to, you know, um, and I, I, I'm hoping that um, other areas of innovation in Asia, like Singapore, South Korea, et cetera, do not, it's Japan, do not completely face collateral damage of the deteriorating relationship between China and, um, and the United States. But um, that's where more clarity and, and different voices, I think, you know, down the line will have to come to have to step up because, you know, right now, I think it's actually, it's 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 crazy. People are afraid to take money from people in Singapore, or people take afraid to take money from people in Japan, thinking they may have something to do with China, or they're they're not exactly sure. It the onus is really on the U.S. government to make things uh, a bit more clear, um, because you're really going to stymie innovation. Because there's only so there's a lot of capital in the United States, but there's only so much capital, um, and you know there's a lot of capital in Asia that's out there that I I know me and look I'm. I, I spent almost half my life in uniform, right? Um, and and by the way, I also worked. In, I, I worked in intelligence when I was in the military. Um, I, I think it's absolutely insane to to cut out some of these other areas. But yes, if you're going, if you're uh, seek to work with the U.S. government and you're taking money from China, um, I would be very wary of that. And, and I mean, to myself, and you know, I started off with the Financial Times Group as a pharma and a reporter out in Hong Kong. I came over, uh, you know, transferred offices to New York in 2006 because, you know, how can you be a biotech reporter without coming to New York? 
because, you know, the U.S. is the center of biotech pretty much. So, I mean, I, I've been following everything coming out of, you know, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, you know, even earlier this month saying that, you know, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange basically came out and said that, you know, in the next 10 years, we believe we'll surpass the, not even 10 years, they said in the next five to 10 years, we really believe we'll surpass the NASDAQ in terms of, you know, as the largest biotech stock trading exchange. So, I mean, personally, I, I think that's a pretty strong statement. I don't know what you guys think in terms of, you know, where the Hong Kong stock exchange is, you know, compared to NASDAQ. You know, I, I've had some clients sort of ask me about it. And, you know, from my personal view is that, um, you know, the level of sophistication in terms of the investor base between the U.S. and Hong Kong and Asia is just completely different. Um, not to mention, there's just a lot of different structures in place, you know, that the U.S. is, is far ahead. And, and my second sort of follow-on question to that is, you know, what do we have to do in the U.S. to kind of maintain our leadership position, you know, as, you know, the center of innovation and life sciences? So I, I'll jump in first, and uh, Kimberly, we spoke about this earlier. I, because of the tension right now between China and Hong Kong, uh, I, I just don't see it becoming the uh, 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 the leading stock exchange for biotech. I just I just can't imagine how it will happen. I don't think the Chinese government is going to change, and I don't think. Uh, uh, companies wanting companies wanting to list in the biotech space would feel comfortable doing that. I, uh, Sherman and Mara, what do you think? Um, yeah, so I I I can't see that happening for several different reasons. Uh, in that way, um, I, I think that the I think that you will see um, either this administration will retain power and will eventually realize it. Or then a new a new administration will come into power and will automatically flow that way. Where we will almost form a block, a natural block with with the Europeans, um, and that will keep money a little bit more money on this side of the world than than it would flow necessarily to Hong Kong. I think that if you're an investor, I think large institutional investors that back those companies on those stock exchanges will be wary of that because of the controls and supports. Uh, of those stock exchanges relative to the Western stock exchanges, mainly, you know, like a, a lot of the NASDAQ. Um, I, you know, if you're, I don't know, I mean, the large pools of capital here are the T Row prices, the Vanguards, and, and folks like that. Are they going to bat, are they going to put money into companies that are listing on the, on the, on the Hong Kong stock exchange? Um, I, I really can't see something like, like that occurring. Uh, the large, and, and that go, that's the same with the large pools of, of that uh of that european capital so um yeah i, I really don't see that occurring i don't know I, i'll be a little bit of a contrarian here I, I i guess two things one is there is so much money you know we might be going for a downturn but there is so much money put it going into venture capital going into investment you know whether it's the top one percent point one five percent you know the top people have eight ton of money and i think that that will go into companies everywhere and the money is not just in um the u.s and, and probably less in europe so i see a lot of money being spread out i think there are I, I mostly agree with what sherman said but i think that there will be notable exceptions and you can see grail that went public and did a large offering on the hong kong exchange and did it on the u.s exchange and then today announced it's going to be bought by no surprise since it was a luminous spin-out. But I think that the best of technologies and people will find places. I'm a globalist of nature, so I'm not sure I worry about it. Um, but I think there's enough money going around even post-COVID that everything will find all the good ideas and good people will find money somewhere. And, and I want to. I wanted to say, Kimberly, you your question was specifically the Hong Kong exchange relative to the Nasdaq. Um, I yeah, think the yeah. Hong Kong exchange on its own um, is well. I mean, I think it will be okay. I think I think we do need an option like that. Um, and and then you also asked about innovation here in the United yeah. States. You yeah, asked almost a separate question. Um, I I know that it's it's. I think it's a committee now. Uh, Senator Schumer. 
and um, a, a Republican senator whose name is escaping me, have the Endless Frontier Act, uh, which is $100 billion of investment from the U.S. government for different uh, scientific areas uh, to come into the United States. I, I know they're, they're, there's talk also uh, in Congress about plusing up uh, the, the size of the capital to go into into the life sciences, et cetera. I mean, I think that, you know, we will in the United States, um, you know, there'll be enough money. If you're, if you're a smart person, you have a great idea, um, you'll be able to get funded. Uh, let's put it that way, right? Not, you know, us necessarily relative to uh, other areas around the world, um, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, Chinese have plenty of money, Europeans have plenty of money, et cetera. But I, I think us on our own, I think we will continue uh, to innovate and we will continue to be uh, right now with the world's leader as far as innovation. I think that will continue at least in the, in the near to near to, uh, near to midterm. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, we will at least be competitive uh, even in the long term. You know, I, I've been surprised. We do we do CEO summits. Uh, we do one in Europe and we do one in in uh, in the States. And I've been surprised at how many companies have raised money from their living room, from their porch, from wherever, during without having to go on a roadshow during this time of COVID. And moreover, I'm surprised at the fact that European companies, private and public, have both come into the States and raised money during this, this same time. Uh, so it gives me tremendous hope that, you know, life sciences, you know, I agree completely with Mara. Uh, but there is so much money coming into this space right now. And does it have to do with the fact that maybe other sectors are not as interesting? I don't know, but the money is there right now. Um, and it is coming in to support life sciences and whether that, you know, it is, you know, heavily focused on the states, but there's great science in Europe and there's great science also in Asia, including in China, uh, and elsewhere. So I, you know, the, 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 the best of that science will always rise to the top. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks everyone. Um, I know that we have uh, a Q and a session after this, but, uh, we still have a few minutes, I think left. Um, um, I, I guess, uh, obviously it's an election year, um, without getting too much into the politics, but. But I know that I've been getting a lot of emails from people as well, but there was a recent executive order regarding Medicare that happened over this weekend. And, you know, by President Trump aimed at lowering drug prices. Is this something that uh, you're expecting to have immediate impact or do you think, you know, it, it really will depend on, you know, what happens in November? I think, you know, lowering drug prices is a trend that will continue, right? I mean, irrespective of an administration. Um, so that's, I think that's my thought process there. And executive executive actions, executive orders um, can be re replaced by the, the the next person in power. So um, if there's a change of administration, um, you know, obviously there's a potential it, it changes. Um, it's, it's not something I would fret about. I, I mean, I've been in healthcare now for, uh, eight eight years, and it's it's been talked about for a long time, and and this is something that's kind of has been trending in that direction. So I, I don't think it'll come as a surprise to to anyone. I, I I will say that um I think there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now uh, with a lot of different things. I think that will change after the uh, after the election. Uh, not even irrespective of a change in power. Um, I just think that you know um, the current administration will. You know they will solidify their the positions that they've had um i do think that there has been a decent amount of uncertainty though in the last four years um i i, I think that the the counter force the opposite opposing force um that will would occur if there were a change in administration is that they would seek to bring actual clarity um to everything and i think from a, an investor standpoint the mar would agree the one thing I need more than anything, irrespective of who's in power, is clarity. I need to understand that the rules are not going to change on me uh, rapidly if you know after I make this investment. Um, so uh, that's that's my thoughts on that. My last question for everyone is: What are your key takeaways and tips for startups listening to this panel in terms of how they can best position themselves in this current environment? 
Oh, and also the other question is how much, I mean, in an ideal situation, how much funding should companies have, um, you know, now? I, I'm sorry. It, it's easy to say how much funding as much as possible. Um, but from a realistic point of view, um, if you have the opportunity, I think you need at least 18 months to two years, realistically, on not the absolute worst case, because those become ridiculous numbers, but also not the best case, assuming everything will happen as you expect it to. So I think you've got to look at a reasonably negative, but not crazy case and look for 18 months to 24 months of cash. I think for me, the key is clarity. There is a lot of money out there. Go to the venture firms that have a reason to invest in you because they are seeing lots of things. So look for venture firms that have other companies in their portfolio that has real interest in your area. Make sure when you present, you talk about what I like to call the so what. They have plenty of choices. They, you need to explain not just why you're good, but why you make a difference and why you are likely to succeed. Because most people, unfortunately, don't. And describing that up front with that so what question, at least for my venture firm, is what leads us to fall in love with the deal and invest. Yeah. Um, I think for, for me, you want to have enough funding to outlast this period of extreme uncertainty. I think you need to remember that this economic crisis and some of the geopolitical issues we're facing right now are driven or feel they're symptomatic. They're fueled by a health crisis, um, the pandemic and um, the health crisis. The reason why it's been able to continue and being able to spread to, to in certain areas relative to others um, is a, really a, to be frank, a, denial of science and belief in science. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that denial of science is helping to bring about the health crisis, which is subsequently feeling an economic crisis, which is feeling uh, this extreme uncertainty that we're, that we're facing right now. So you need to have enough money. Right now we're in a very extreme, because we have the elections also extremely uncertain period. You need to have enough money to get out of this area of extreme uncertainty. For early stage uh, company, I don't think anything has changed. You need 18 to 20. You typically want to try to raise 18 to 24 months of capital, right? And you're hoping that there's yet another cycle. Matter of fact, as I like, to, as some people say, if we're not out of this this period of extreme uncertainty two years from now, you got much, much, much bigger things to worry about. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, a, a, the good rule of thumb is, you know, 18 to 24 four months of capital. If for whatever reason you're not able to raise that, then figure out what your clear, discernible milestones are and articulate to the investor how much money it will take you to get to that milestone. Right. Um, and, and so break down, let's say that two or three million dollar raise into four or five or six different segments. Um, and and and, and you'll you'll be perpetually raising, but it, it is what it is. We all are both both uh startups and 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 investors we're, we're constantly raising. So yeah. So so and if I can just finish up, I, I know we're over time and I just want to say that I agree completely with Mara and I, I agree with Sherman. So I think I, I think that may wrap it up. Kimberly. Great. Thanks everyone. Um, I'm going to turn over the panel to Joan now uh, in case uh, there are any questions. So, uh, first of all, thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, panel. You guys did a terrific job of covering a, a very broad topic in a very short period of time. Um, I've been monitoring the chat and some of the questions that came in um, also before this panel. Um, now, one of the questions, of course, was, um, how much money are you willing to put in my company right now? Which is the, the perpetual question of the early stage entrepreneur. But it would be very helpful, um, Mara and Sherman, to um, just very briefly say, we're looking for companies in this space that do are, that are at this stage. I can I can quickly say we are looking for companies that are in diagnostics, devices, or digital health that are late stage A, early stage B, close to revenue, and will use less than fifty to seventy five million in total uh, money in. 
Perfect. Sherman? Yes. Digital health. Uh, also, there's an interest in, in leveraging bleeding edge tech, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks. Uh, there's interest there. C stage uh, investors. Um, we, you know, we're going to put anywhere from seven hundred fifty thousand to a million dollars into your company. Uh, we will do a pre seed investment if you are a military veteran or several people on the on the found people on the founding team are military veterans. Terrific, and uh, I know that that. That has been a space that there's been a need for quite some time as they come back with great skills and great ideas to, to move these things forward. So kudos to you and your team on that. Another question that um, has been coming up, and by the way, for those of you that were not able to join us on this morning's um, panel where Michelle Breckelman, who is the head of SCP Asia, did a phenomenal job. Um, talking about the landscape for digital pathology, digital health, and um, telemedicine in the Asian region, and he did it live from Singapore. So um, I would strongly encourage you, if you go back to the schedule, you can click on that presentation schedule, and now when you stream video, it's the actual recorded presentation. So um, there's some phenomenal data there for everybody that's in that space. Also, as we're moving forward and we're looking towards the future, um, the VCs have attracted an obscene amount of capital in the last six months, more than they have in recent years for the same period. Um, because people are not going into um, other things that are just unstable right now. Um, but those VCs are gonna have to deploy that capital along a VC timeline, how do you think that's going to impact their willingness to go into earlier stage deals, or do you think they're still going to be sitting on the higher end? Mara, Mar, I'd love to hear from you, um, <laughs> me personally, uh, but I, I, I would actually say nothing really changes. Um, you know, I, I tell guys, I mean, in, in, in the healthcare space, we've been predicting these things for, for many years. So we've been thinking about these things for many years. So. Um, you know, my number one question, there's two things. Typically, because I do some investments outside of healthcare, typically it's team. I bet the jockey, not the horse when I make an investment. Um, but when it comes to healthcare, you know, my key thing is, can this company improve clinical outcomes? Um, you know, do I, do I, have, do I, can I, do I assess that they have the potential to? So whether that's pre-seed or seed stage for me, um, it doesn't matter if I assess you can improve clinical outcomes and your team is excellent in my and me and my team's eyes, uh, then we we're willing to make an investment. And I'll just quickly say, I agree with you, Sherman. At the stage of our fund and the relatively small size, while I appreciate everything you say, we don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. So we want to eliminate the technology risk going into it so we can help on the rest of the commercialization and moving it out broadly. So a little bit of a different twist, but generally uh, generally agree with you. In future funds, there's more people we could take that perspective, but now we can. Thank you, Mara. And um, you know, Kimberly, you're there in New York and you are seeing a lot of the companies that are adjusting right now and you know how the conversations are going with the VCs and with some of your clients. Um, I'd be interested in kind of your take. What do you see as, you know, that was then, this is now, and this is what's coming? I think, uh, you know, nothing's really changed in terms of, you know, investors are still looking for the experience management teams. You know, they're looking at the science. You know, recently I had a client that, you know, came out of stealth mode uh, from technology out of UC San Diego, and they closed like a $137 million Series B financing round. Uh, during the pandemic in record time, there's another company that, you know, Sarah also knows the founder, um, and uh, Tony Sun, uh, who used to be uh, a partner, I believe, at Azon Capital, and he just, you know, uh, uh, launched, uh, not launched, but, um, you know, um, Zentala, who's also out in, out in New York, um, just did an IPO during the pandemic, and they came out of stealth mode, you know, something like last you know, fourth quarter of last year, and then, you know, immediately did an IPO during the pandemic. So, I mean, that, it, I think, again, you know, it really depends on, and then on the flip side, you know, 
there are some other companies that, you know, um, I'm seeing. Actually, I'm also uh, uh, my other hat, I guess, since we're talking about hats. I wish I wore hats, but Joan, I love your hat. Um, it is that, you know, and, and one of Sherman's mutual friends, actually, Sherman and, uh, and, and uh, the VC partner that I know actually went to uh, Chicago Booth together for their MBA program, Shruti Gandhi at Array Ventures. So I've been, you know, working with that VC fund for the last few years looking at digital health investments. And, you know, it, again, it's sort of like, you know, this adding cost to the system, you know, we're seeing those companies just crash and burn much faster right now in the pandemic. And it's, it's cutting costs in the system, you know, it's accelerating. So, you know, there's another company I, I'm working with that, you know, spun out of uh, Coastal Ventures in Stanford and Harvista. They have a really cool uh, AI cardi, like cardiac MRI, but, you know, virtual AI assisted cardiac MRI. They can basically plug into the cardiac MRI. And it's almost like drone technology where you can like be anywhere, but you know, manually, virtually, like, uh, uh, do the cardiac MRI scan. So it's like instead of that MRI technician having to be in the hospital and exposing themselves, you know, I, you know, I could be in the safety of my, you know, in, in somewhere else and, and basically manage, you know, 10, 20, 30 different cardiac MRI machines. So, so I think technologies like that are really interesting and, you know, because of the pandemic, something like that, you know, it's accelerating hospitals trying to talk to them. But, you know, on the flip side, if it's something that, you know, is just converting something into something else, but it's not really adding a lot of value into the system, you know, those companies aren't doing so well, unfortunately. So if it's like a nice to have, you know, Sherman, I'm sure you see a lot of these pitch decks too. Like if it's a nice to have like incremental benefit on the healthcare system, you know, we're not taking a risk in investing because, you know, we kind of need to save the money to make sure our current portfolio companies have enough cash to get through <laughs> the pandemic. So right. I think the, 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 the bar, I guess, for investment, at least for, I could speak on behalf of for Array, you know, is, it is higher because of, you know, what we're going through right now. So the companies that we're investing in are going to be companies that we really think, okay, this, this is going to be, you know, I don't want to use these cliche DC words, but a game changer, something that's going to really disrupt, you know, particular industry or something like that. So, great. And Sarah, the interesting thing and probably the most common question that I'm getting before this week, during this week, and I'm sure after this week is when can we all get together again? As my whole, everything that I've done in my career has been around convening people to solve problems and do things better. And most, I could have never imagined Joan in my wildest of dreams that, uh, that we would be doing that virtually versus in, per in person. In fact, when I realized that we would have to shift and go virtual, um, uh, you know, with our salon series, it, re it took my breath away, but it's it's proven to be a really valuable tool in order to convene people um, when we can't meet in person. Um, you know, and there are other benefits. I mean, you know, who would have ever thought that you could do your IPO from your living room, from your basement, from your kid's bedroom? And people are doing that. Um, and and I think I think that will be a paradigm change in the way that people go about raising funds. I'm not so sure for younger companies, um, companies that don't know investors yet, that haven't been out there yet. I think it will be more difficult for them. Um, but we we were uh, we know that JPM and Biofuture will both be uh, Biotech Showcase will both be virtual. We're planning that Biofuture will be an in-person meeting. But as Mara said, I'm not so sure about when the vaccines will get to everybody. So we're planning right now that it may be in person and it may also be virtual. And or if it is in person, that it will be in person with a mask requir requirement or something else to uh, to protect uh, protect health. Um, I believe that you know toward the end of next year, you know in the fall, going back into into 2022. Uh, that's when we will get back to being in person again more fully. 
uh, when um, a big an investor in the space said that to me a couple of months ago. I just could not believe it. Uh, but, you know, that is, in fact, going to be our reality. It won't be until 2022, I believe, that we will be able to resume you know, in-person meetings with the same vigor, so to say, as we have done in the past. Thanks, Sarah. But there's more to come. There's the virtual universe in order to, uh, to take the place of that. And we're learning new things in this environment. Um, a couple of things, you know, it, some of my, my friends on this call, and, and I, I truly count each of them as friends, and I am greatly appreciative of you're stepping up and stepping in to help with this with this year. Um, but we have to do things differently. Um, and you all know, you know, I, I turned 60 at the end of the month and, you know, had to figure out in the year when our healthcare community and our life science community have worked harder and been more impactful than ever before. How could I not tell their story? And so I took all the money that we had raised so that we could have a big in-person event and I bought television time. And so we produced a one hour television special and it is airing tonight at seven o'clock Arizona time and it will be available online um, you know, simultaneously um, thereafter. So I truly hope that each of us takes this opportunity to learn something new, to do something differently, as Sarah said, you, have, you, know, you had to adapt. But more importantly, as has been emphasized by Sherman and by Mara, what you do has to make life better for other people. It has to make an impact so that you earn that white hat. So um, thank you everybody.